Good morning and welcome to the panel on hope, human dignity, and the Catholic imagination. My name is Sharif Gerges. I'm an associate professor at the law school here, and it's my great honor to moderate a panel featuring two of my heroes. The first is Helen Alvare, who's the pro a professor of law and the Robert A. Levy Chair of Law and Liberty at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason, and a longtime collaborator with the church, both universal and local. She was three years at a law firm litigating on behalf of an archdiocese, three years in the general counsel's office of the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, and 10 years as the public face of the US bishops before Congress, university and public audiences, and television and radio on matters ranging from abortion and euthanasia to women, religious freedom, and capital punishment. She's presently a member of the Vatican's dicastery on laity, family, and life, a representative for the permanent observer mission to the Organization for America, uh, to the Organization for American States, and a member of two Vatican commissions concerning sex abuse guidelines for religious entities. She's authored books on religious freedom, religious freedom after the sexual revolution, and family law, putting children's interests first in US family law and policy, which is with Cambridge University Press, and more than 45 scholarly articles and books also on these topics. She's currently of counsel, scholar advocate to the law firm of First and 14th in Colorado concerning Catholic institutional religious freedom matters. She also authors amicus briefs before the US Supreme Court. And I can tell you that it's, it's very rare to find a pro-life legal scholar. It's even rarer to find a pro-life, pro-family legal scholar. Still rarer to find one who's a woman. And rarest of all to find one who takes the fight to the Guild of Family Law Scholars. That's basically a class of one, and its name is Helen. And she takes a, an almost pathological degree of courage and freedom from other people's opinions to do that. And she's done it uh, with, a, with a ton of grace and poise. Richard Dorflinger is also a tireless leader in the pro-life movement for over 30 years. He's been involved in every single life issue, including embryo research, abortion, physician-assisted suicide, and euthanasia at the very, very highest level in federal and state governments. His efforts were integral to the conception, passage, and continued vitality of parental notification and consent, unborn victims of violence, and born alive infant protection laws. He's saved lives in those ways, as well as partial, partial birth abortion bans, conscience protections, the Weldon Amendment, which prevents parenting, patenting of human embryos, and abortion funding restrictions, both domestic and international, such as the Hyde Amendment and the Mexico City policy. Hugely consequential. Dorflinger was also instrumental in the ultimately unsuccessful campaign to protect the unborn in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare. And in addition to this work, Dorflinger is a bioethics expert and consummate researcher unapologetically and effectively communicating the moral basis of life issues. And I can tell you that he is an extraordinary walking encyclopedia of everything you might ever need to know in a discussion about pro-life issues and has been subjected to many email inquiries from me <laughs> and everybody else I know. So it's a huge honor for me to be moderating a panel of people that I have been listening to for, I don't know, I haven't been around for a decade, well, a couple decades. <laughs> Uh, and, and we're going to listen to today for 25 minutes each and then open it up to Q&A. So, is it Richard, are you first? Uh, apparently so. Okay, Richard. <laughs> uh, welcome. So let me get, uh, explain a little bit about what Helen and I would like to do. As uh, Sharif said, our, our topic is hope, human dignity, and the Catholic imagination. In case that seems a little vague, uh, I thought it was important last night that Judith Wolf said, when you talk about the Catholic imagination, that's not talking about imaginary things. It's about a worldview that sees reality more deeply than, uh, than other people may do. Uh, I will explore how that applies to the idea of innate human dignity and recount some personal narratives showing how perceptions may deepen regarding that being whose dignity is most contested today, the unborn. Helen will focus specifically on how the Catholic imagination, the Catholic worldview, may contribute to the current debate on abortion after the Dobbs decision, giving us some hope of making progress. So see, I got all the words in there, hope, human dignity. <laughs> okay. so. 
In his essay, The Catholic Writer Today, uh, the great essayist and poet, Dana Joya, who is a speaker here at this conference, gives us a helpful description of the worldview of a Catholic writer, otherwise known as the Catholic imagination. This worldview does not necessarily mean that the writer accepts all Catholic teachings or lives by them, or that the writer enjoys writing about saints rather than sinners. Uh, Graham Greene being an excellent example, uh, both a sinner and a writer about sinners. Uh, <laughs> so the features of this worldview. First, humanity is struggling in a fallen world, caught up in a drama of sin and redemption. Second, evil exists, but nature is not evil. It is sacramental, filled with meaning, and even charged with the invisible presence of God. Third, suffering can be redemptive, especially if it emulates the sacrificial passion of Christ. And fourth, we must take the long view of all situations. That's always good advice on politics in general, but I'm talking about a long view that starts with creation and ends in eternity. Uh, so this is a way of looking beyond the most superficial descriptions of people, things, and relationships to discern reality more deeply. Uh, as another Catholic poet, Robert Cording, has written, words point to being that is intrinsically meaningful rather than to a meaningless world on which meaning must be imposed. Or to quote Catholic novelist Dean Koontz, because we human beings often pride ourselves on the certainty of our knowledge and our opinions, a failure to comprehend disquiets us. Consequently, we lie to ourselves about the nature of the world. We resist inferring the truth that is implicit in every moment of every day. We want a simple world, but it is instead thrillingly complex. Complexity disquiets us because it implies meaning, and we are afraid of meaning, except as we craft it to suit ourselves. Uh, my last quote from a poet, <clears throat> James Matthew Wilson, also a speaker here. In his poem, The Consolation of Oranges, based rather loosely on the encounter of Boethius with Lady Philosophy in his uh, great classic book, uh, Consolation of Philosophy. Lady Philosophy says in the poem, atheists are those who, having looked at symbols spelled in branching letters, scattered dust, see only things, not what they mean. So this Catholic view of the world in all its depth and complexity should influence the way we respond to difficult social and political issues. And the world is a more impoverished and dangerous place when that is not part of the conversation. I want to take a look at the effort by the United Nations after the horrors of World War II to write a universal declaration on human rights that got approved by the UN member nations in 1948. The, uh, there were no dissenting votes, though uh, I think six communist nations abstained because it still had the right of a citizen to leave his country if he wanted to. <laughs> However, uh, the great Catholic philosopher, Jacques Maritain, who has been called the godfather of the Declaration, he was very much involved in all the early conceptual discussions leading to it. He later wrote, during one of the meetings at which the rights of man were being discussed, someone was astonished that certain proponents of violently opposed ideologies had agreed on the draft of a list of rights. Yes, they replied, we agree on these rights, provided we are not asked why. With the why, the dispute begins. The, dis the basis of human rights was seen in the Declaration as the inherent dignity of every human being. That's the why, but they could not define it and they could not explain why it's real. Then they would all disagree or it would break down. 
Uh, that inherent human dignity was later cited in UN declarations on human cloning, which condemned cloning as a violation of human dignity, even if it is only the cloning of human embryos for research that will destroy them. That's in 19, uh, 1998. Oh, I'm sorry, that's in 2005. In 1998, a de declaration on the human genome and human rights declared the inherent dignity of all human beings regardless of their genetic characteristics, again, at all stages of development. In recent years, this edifice of international human rights is in danger of crumbling because ethicists and political figures of a more utilitarian bent have insisted that dignity is a meaningless word or is simply a confusing synonym for radical individual autonomy. That's the defining characteristic of the human person. In the worldview that uh, some have called expressive individualism, and if you want a complete account of how that distorts discussions on abortion, euthanasia, and other things, we have Carter Sneed, long time the director of this center, and his book, What It Means to Be Human. The result is the freedom to choose one's own lifestyle and even one's own identity it becomes the core human right, and human beings who cannot exercise and express their autonomy may not have rights at all, hence the abortion debate. But of course, Catholics and many other Christians are happy to tell us what human dignity is and why it's real. Uh, Canadian diplomat John Humphrey, who assisted in the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, later wrote that the process was especially dominated by Catholics Actually, he said Catholics and communists, but the communists were a distant second. <laughs> and that the final document was like, quote, Christian morality without the Tommy rot. In the Catholic worldview, dignity is the innate and incalculable worth of each and every human being created by God in his image and likeness and called to eternal redemption with him. Human being is a union of body and soul that uniquely combines the vulnerability of material nature and the transcendence of the spirit. I'll try to get that into a human document, though. To forget this human dignity, to reduce fellow human beings to mere means, uh, means for or obstacles to one's own advancement, is to herald what C.S. Lewis not a Catholic, but in this respect, a defender of the Catholic imagination, uh, called the abolition of man. As Lewis wrote in his essay, The Weight of Glory, the Christian view is startlingly different from that. He says, it is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship or else a horror and a corruption, such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of those destinations. In the light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary, people. And nowhere in current politics are people in their relationships bluntly reduced to a narrow, one-dimensional view than in our discourse about abortion. In its 1973 decision in Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court noted two questions about the being destroyed in abortion. Is this a person meriting equal protection of the laws? It replied that as far as it could tell, the answer to this legal question was that the Constitution's use of the word person uh, had chiefly only postnatal application. Actually, I think uh, quite a lot of them only meant adults. Uh, then it asked, is this a human life? Well, philosophers and theologians disagreed. So the court said it was in no position to give an answer. But of course, it's really a biological question with a very straightforward answer. Each individual human life begins with the embryo, then goes through the stages of fetus, infant, toddler, school-aged child, adolescent, all the way to potential Supreme Court justice. 
For decades, supporters of abortion worked to deny that answer or declare it irrelevant to the moral and legal issue. More recently, some acknowledged the child in the womb is a living human being, but asked, so what? This is an invading stranger that could ruin a woman's plans for her own life, and she has the power and the right to take care of that obstacle as she is the more important individual. It's justified killing. I think uh, John Stewart said recently, uh, talking about pro-lifers, he said, well, they think it's murder, and it kind of is, but I'm okay with that. Uh, so following the court's reversal of Roe in the Dobbs decision, though, we have a rather remarkable evolution, a further evolution, abandoning any acknowledgement of reality. Uh, Dr. John Sullivan of Duke University observed at the conference here in November last year, major medical organizations reacting to the Dobbs decision actually managed never to mention that the unborn child or even a fetus exists at all. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists condemned the decision as an attack on reproductive health. AMA called it an assault on a reproductive health service, and the New England Journal of Medicine editorials, editorialized that it, quote, inserts government into the personal lives and health care of Americans. In all these statements, Dr. Sullivan said, the fetus is not even a thing anymore. It's like discussing heart surgery without ever mentioning a heart. These groups also said pro-life laws are not evidence-based evidence -based, after they had suppressed the basic evidence of what an abortion is and what it does. That strategy is fully reflected in the abortion rights movement's uh, flagship federal proposal, the Women's Health Protection Act, which oddly enough would, among other things, greatly weaken efforts to protect women's health when they seek abortions. Uh, that is among, health regulations are among the things that can delay or limit full and ready access to abortion. And access has become the key word, replacing choice. Uh, earlier versions of this bill, which have been, has been around for 10 years and very few people have noticed, but now uh, it's a live concern because it is the primary legislative uh, ambition of uh, one of our presidential candidates. The uh, earlier versions had um, findings, a very long list of findings, including the finding that abortion should be regulated no more than procedures of comparable routine nature like colonoscopies. So. If, if the fetus exists, it's something like an intestinal polyp. Um, in the 17-page bill, which now has no findings, they trimmed it down a little, the word fetus never occurs at all. Uh, it does say fetal survival once as a definition of viability, the uh, likelihood of fetal survival outside the womb, which means you're not even a fetus until after you're born. Uh, this must be confusing to maternal fetal medicine specialists and obstetricians who do know that every pregnancy makes them responsible for two patients. But one could dissect this avoidance of reality all day and make very logical arguments, and people would say it's just your opinion. Today, lived experience is said to be the privileged source for moral attitudes. I want to look finally at some medical professionals whose lived experience confronted them with a somewhat clearer and deeper vision of prenatal life. Uh, most of us have probably heard of the experience of Dr. Bernard Nathanson, who had performed many thousands of abortions, but had a shock of recognition when he saw an ultrasound image of the struggling child being aborted. Interestingly, he later joined the Catholic Church. He said it was not because he agreed with his objections to abortion. He had come to that when he was an atheist. He said it was the one place he could go where he was told he could be forgiven. That drama of sin and redemption again. Abby Johnson had a similar experience. 
Uh, she was moved both by her view of an ultrasound during an abortion and by the fact that the pro-life protesters outside the abortion clinic where she worked cared more about her as a person than her employers did. But let me mention three other cases that may not be as familiar as they have one characteristic in common which you may recognize. Dr. Anthony Levitino used to perform abortions, including late-term procedures. But one day, his own young child, playing outside the house, ran after a ball that had rolled into the street and was hit and killed by a car. He would later tell me that when he was grieving in shock over his child's death, the thought came to him, this is what I do for a living. He became a compelling spokesperson and an expert witness in Congress for the pro-life position. Dr. Shinya Yamanaka, a professor at Kyoto University in Japan, not a Catholic, but uh, um, a member of the Shinto religion. He wanted to pursue embryonic stem cell research. As the New York Times later reported about his experience, inspiration can appear in unexpected places. Dr. Yamanaka, father of two daughters, was invited to visit a friend's in vitro fertilization clinic and looked at a human embryo under the microscope. He told the New York Times, when I saw the embryo, I suddenly realized there was such a small difference between it and my daughters. I thought, we can't keep destroying embryos. For our research, there must be another way. Ultimately, he developed a way of producing cells with the versatility of embryonic stem cells by reprogramming, reprogramming ordinary adult cells. Uh, and he has made the embryonic stem cell campaign largely obsolete. They're actually better for clinical use than embryonic stem cells. So he called them induced pluripotent stem cells. And he won the Nobel Prize for medicine or physiology he also won the admiration of scientists who had been working with the embryonic stem cells, but who were relieved that now they no longer had to do so and admitted only then that they had always had moral qualms of their own, but they couldn't mention them because they needed those cells. Uh, one you know, very utilitarian ethicist uh, uh, said, who had been attacking, you know, pro-life position on these embryos for years, said he should also get the Nobel Prize in ethics. Uh, as an aside, Dr. Yamanaka presented his research when he had only so far managed to achieve this in mice to a conference co-sponsored by the International Federation of Catholic Medical Associations and the Pontifical Academy for Life in Rome he told them the story about his shock of recognition at the embryo, and all the Catholic scientists said, oh, keep pursuing that. Go on, move on to human cells. We're with you. you know? And so he did. Finally, Dr. Lisa Harris has performed and trained others in performing late-term abortions at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor for many years. She has been especially candid in describing these abortions as a form of, quote, violence, and in telling other physicians about the emotions one must set aside in order to provide what she continues to see as a much needed service for women. To illustrate this point, she uh, recounts experiences of her own. She had once dismembered a 23-week-old child in the mother's womb and the same day watched a medical team work to save a prematurely born infant of the same age. Quote, I thought to myself, how bizarre it was that, that I could have legally dismembered this fetus now newborn if it were inside its mother's uterus, but that the same kind of violence against it now would be illegal and unspeakable. Uh, hmm, yes, that is interesting. <laughs> <coughs> but, <coughs> but then she recounts something else. And I apologize for how graphic some of this is. She says, when I was a little over 18 weeks with my own now preschool child, I did a second trimester abortion. 
for a patient who was also a little over 18 weeks pregnant. As I reviewed her chart, I realized that I was more interested uh, than usual in seeing the fetal parts when I was done, since they would so closely resemble those of my own fetus. Uh, just interesting so far. I used electrical suction to remove the amniotic fluid, picked up my forceps, and began to remove the fetus in parts, as I always did. With my first pass of the forceps, I grabbed an extremity and began to pull it down. I could see a small foot hanging from the teeth of my forceps. With a quick tug, I separated the leg. Precisely at that moment, I felt a kick a fluttery thump, thump in my own uterus. It was one of the first times I felt fetal movement. There was a leg and foot in my forceps and a thump, thump in my abdomen. Instantly, tears were streaming from my eyes without me, meaning my conscious brain, even being aware of what was going on. I felt as if my response had come entirely from my body, bypassing my usual cognitive processing completely. A message seemed to travel from my hand and my uterus to my tear ducts. It was an overwhelming feeling, a brutally visceral response, heartfelt and unmediated by my training or my feminist pro-choice politics. It was one of the more, more raw moments in my life. She kept doing the abortions, but she said they made her sadder than before. That one moment of piercing reality. This could have been my daughter. Uh, she managed to suppress later. Uh, so I'm interested in what all of these accounts have in common. They all went beyond what may seem to be abstractions involved in talking about personhood and even human life. Uh, to son or daughter. The victim of abortion is like my son or daughter who decisively does matter to me personally because of our relationship. But that seems to be a first chink in the armor of expressive individualism. The relationship of a parent to the vulnerable, helpless child that he or she helped produce, who depends on that parent for everything, beginning with survival. That same shift is portrayed, this is my final point, in TV ads produced by the Vitae Foundation, working with a surveying group called the Right Brain People. These were ads for TV that were designed to convince women to consider going to a pregnancy aid center before they make a final decision for abortion. Uh, one of the ads shows a woman taking an early morning jog through her neighborhood. She speaks of external pressures from others. Everyone's telling me how I should feel. It's not like I plan to get pregnant, not now. It's a brief flashback of an angry boyfriend yelling at her. Telling me how to feel, what to do, then not sticking around when it really counts. So now it's all up to me. But abortion, mm, not me. I have to live with myself. As she turns, you see that she's beginning to show her pregnancy. And she says, we'll make it. Yeah, we'll make it just fine. The move from I to we, recognizing that your closest relationship is to this child who radically depends on you, and the external pressures, the invading strangers, or all the people who are telling you to just take care of it. Uh, half a century, our legal system has been trying to suppress this parental instinct. But it contradicts a very deep-seated intuition in human nature, and it ignores the need on the part of all of us to make real connections with others, to depend on each other, and to be open to unexpected changes in our lives. Because we are embodied beings, not just abstract wills to power, we depend on each other for our very lives and for everything we might achieve, and we owe that same help to others who depend on us. That, of course, also depends on Again, validating the close relationship of man and woman in marriage, whose love can result in that helpless, dependent being. But I think by beginning to look at 
these people and these relationships somewhat more deeply, we would be on the road to something like the Catholic imagination. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It is a delight to be here, especially with people. I've admired Richard for four decades, and Sharif will eventually get to that four-decade mark with me. It's been about two decades, decade and a half. I didn't think you're old enough to be too full. So uh, it's just a delight to be here with, with some heroes of mine. Um, my aim is to consider quite specifically how post obs in an environment that's really been dominated by messages about abortion that are inhumane and hopeless, uh, Catholics might <clears throat> step in. Um, uh, my remarks are gonna have three parts. Uh, first, a brief identification of the Catholic imagination. Really, Richard's captured most of it. I'll just emphasize a point or two. And then I wanna limb the current aspects of the current, it, it's too much to call it a conversation about abortion, it's, it's more brutal than that. It's just things that are out there on either side of the issue that are being said about abortion. And third, um, consider what the church might do at this time. Um, I'm gonna suggest here something that is a surprise to myself as I thought about this, which is that Catholics at this time take up a specifically religious message with insights from the Catholic imagination. I would not have said this in the past. Um, Richard can tell you when we were together for those, the, the 10 more, most fun years of my work life, I, mean, I love what I do now, but the pro-life office was a special place and Richard was the brains of the outfit and it was just so much fun. <laughs> Richard was also the file cabinet of the outfit, but now that file cabinet is in his head. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I, uh, I, we started with the secular argument, right? When I testified before Congress, when I went to universities, when I'd go to editorial boards, and then I'd say, and also the Catholic, da, 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 da. I would not do that now. I think something very new and powerful, nothing short of the good news, is what can break through the current insanity on this topic. So first, regarding the Catholic imagination, you know, I'm sure there are slight variations among the folks who have spoken about it here. Um, but I think we agree generally that it's a set of convictions um, about actually the way things really are. And Richard stressed that too. You see the word imagination, you think imaginary, but I think everyone here would say it's about the way things really are, which become the lenses through which one sees the world and the lens through which you respond to it regarding your whole life on earth, okay? Which come from Catholic scripture and tradition, Catholic social teaching. Um, I think this captures not only reality, but all of reality, right? And how we are to see it. And then again, how we respond. Um, I think this is the spirit of the Catholic imagination captured by, of course, one of the queens of the Catholic imagination, Flannery O'Connor. Uh, just to say her name here is to have the whole place going, yeah, yeah, Flannery, right? She wrote to one of her correspondents in her marvel, I cannot recommend this enough, even if you've never read any Flannery, um, her, the collection of her letters called The Habit of Being. I, I sit alone and read these and I am laughing till I'm choking. I have to go into the kitchen and get water. Um, she's writing to a friend who's at that time just called a, and this friend had a very fraught relationship <clears throat> with the Catholic faith. Um, and she believes that the Catholic view of the human body is rather silly with ideas like imago dei, incarnation, resurrection of the body, virgin birth. And Flannery responds to her saying, I think you need to think about it this way. Um, what you're seeing, she says, is really what the limited human mind can grasp. But the Christian notions aren't only real, but they're the fundamental realities of the world you're living in. She writes the following. For you, it may be a matter of not being able to accept what you call a suspension of the laws of the flesh and the physical. But for my part, I think that when I know what the laws of the flesh and the physical reality are, then I'll know what God is. We know them as we see them, not as God sees them, but for God, it should be, and for us, it must be, the virgin birth, the incarnation, the resurrection, which are the true laws of the flesh and the physical. Death, decay, destruction are the suspension of these laws. I am always astonished, she writes, at the emphasis the church puts on the body. Okay, so I'm gonna add that I think a full appreciation of the Catholic imagination also involves a living as if, right? A living as if these laws of God regarding the human life are a reality. As in, Lord, 
I believe help my unbelief. Right? I certainly do this in my moments of despair, in my moments of I'm, I have, <laughs> what, where, where do I go from here? Where do I take the next step? Assume this is true and then walk out into reality onto that, okay? With this understanding of the Catholic imagination, let me proceed to my second point, which is limiting the elements of the current public discussion of abortion in the US, which is very, very much shaped <coughs> by the Dobbs opinion, but most particularly, it's shaped by the dissent. I mean, if you look at the majority opinion of Dobbs, it says, how can you say that a 14th Amendment substantive due process right, rights that are not in the text, but that are understood by Americans to be fundamental to our freedom, um, consists of something that was banned almost completely in every state and territory, and not even proposed as a possible thought in law reviews until the Supreme Court, bam, comes down with it, January 22nd, 1973. That, that you know, whatever debates we have in the law school as to, was that originalism? What is that? What kind of interpretation of the Constitution was that? Whatever debates we have in that, it was just clear that he just wiped the table and said, it's just not anywhere until Roe says it's everywhere. That cannot be a substantive due process, right? Rather, the conversation about abortion has been dominated by the dissent. Okay, I wrote an article, if anybody wants to take a look at it. I was in a debate with Melissa Murray of, um, of NYU uh, Law School, who put out, I'm just gonna say, and I don't care if it's on tape, the most inane and untruthful um, article. It, it, I just couldn't believe her misstatement of the facts and the law. Um, and, and, to, and take a look at the, the characterization that both of us have about the Dobbs dissent there. Um, the, 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 the communications that are now being had about uh, abortion, um, again, were crystallized in the dissent of Justices Kagan, Sotomayor, and Breyer, and then seamlessly continued in the current political campaign, um, particularly of Kamala Harris. The world they are painting in the dissent and, and in this campaign is hopeless and inhumane. I could argue that their arguments are ahistorical, empirically nonsensical, et cetera, but that's all in my article. Let me emphasize here that they're painting a worldview, a worldview in which it makes no sense to have a baby, okay? Especially if you're the slightest bit concerned about it. This is why when I speak about communicating about abortion within a Catholic imagination, I talk about the need to offer nothing less than an entirely competing worldview. I don't think anything else will suffice at the moment. Not merely convincing facts and not merely particularized helps, uh, offering of helps to pregnant women and new moms. I don't think that's enough anymore. It's all necessary. It's not at all sufficient, okay? So what are the elements of the worldview in favor of abortion? Essentially, first, of course, and none of this will be a shock to you, it's a worldview in which being unfettered, respecting any persons you did not choose, is the key to happiness and freedom, every kind, financially, professional, emotional, etc. And it's interesting, I think about this word unfettered. When I was doing research for my first family law book, um, I discovered that when the pill was being sold to various doctor's offices when it was first invented, they gave every doctor a picture of a gold statue of Andromeda breaking free from her chains. And on the back of it, this is what it said. From the beginning, woman has been a vassal to the temporal demands and the aberrations of the cyclic mechanism of her reproductive system. Now, to a degree heretofore unknown, she is permitted normalization enhancement, a suspension of her cyclic functions and procreative potential. This was given to every doctor to whom they were selling the first generation of the pill. I found a picture of it in a German birth control museum. Just we'll let that lie for a second. Um, and, and, and in this worldview, being unfettered by way of abortion in particular is the most important freedom to women. Listen to the opening line of the Dobbs dissent. Quote, for half a century, Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey have protected the liberty and equality of women, period, unquote. Really? That's the thing, right? By distinction, unmentioned are the rule of law, civil rights protections that women had gotten regarding work, employment, fair credit, accommodations, etc. Unmentioned are their pre-legal God-given gifts, the freedom and equality. No, that's the whole summary is abortion. Closely correlated with this part of legal abortion's worldview is that killing 
is the indispensable path to, world's free to, to women's freedom, killing. Not other things, not education, not financial, whatever, even, not other, even those worldly things, killing. And Richard, I think it might have been Bill Maher who said, in, he was oh. dealing with Pierce Morgan and some other commentator on CNN, and he says, listen, it's, it, you know, they say it's murder, and it, they're kind of right. And then he says, but I'm okay with that. We got enough of you. And I mean, sorry to, uh, not at all. I was thinking, yeah, John Stewart never did us that much favor. He made fun of my hair on a TV show. I'll never forgive him. <laughs> um, uh, I think, you know, no embryology textbook in the country disagrees with this, right? This is what they kind of know, and they're kind of okay with it. And not just killing anyone, but the one whom God, nature, whatever you think, has given specifically you to protect. No one else can do it. Drilling down deeper on this, you can only kill members of your own family. You cannot kill a stranger. <laughs> you can only kill sick, disabled, unborn members of your family, nobody else. And by the way, you can't kill them when they can fight back. You can only kill them when they're at their weakest, okay? And this killing doesn't only prevent problems and avoid enchainment, being fettered. It gives you strength, girl power, spelled G-R-R-R-L, right? Think hundreds or even thousands of women jumping up and down in those pictures when Ireland had its abortion referendum, or when states passed constitutional amendments protecting abortion up through and possibly past birth. Think the billionaire Taylor Swift strutting the stage and calling forth her legions of fans to vote for legal abortion. Think top female comedian Kate McKinnon's notorious RBG impersonation. Think the Ginsburg meme on SNL and as we see the, there's a portrait at the National Portrait Gallery and it just happens to have all the pro-abortion uh, members of the female Supreme Court justices and it's been called, uh, the, the, um, the uh, HuffPo headline about it was, the women of the Supreme Court have the badass portrait they deserve and Slate claims the portrait has become a badass gangsta internet meme. Abortion is girl power. This is the world view, right? And the opposite is women, you know, apparently wearing veils, being barefoot, and apparently cooking for someone in the kitchen somewhere, okay? In this world, beleaguered women just trying to stay free of all entanglements are too weak to be faced with qualms of conscience or second thoughts or even with opposing opinions. Jail. Put in solitary confinement, people who are prayerfully protesting out of clinics. Oppose every informed consent law, right? Call it a trap law. Right, that's, what they, that's their acronym for it. Make sure that the National Institute of Health does not investigate women's emotional reaction to abortion. I was appointed to the uh, President's Council at the National Institute of Health at the beginning of the Bush administration when stem cells were an issue. And they have this survey that follows women, right, from birth to death, and it could look at the effect of abortion on their lives, like some of the European register linkage surveys do. And every year I would say, you know, could we just put one question on this? I mean, we've got 1.4, 1 million, whatever the number of abortions a year. It's one of the most frequent surgeries women have. You ask about all the others, could we ask about this? <laughs> Never did it, right? So they declared that post-abortion reaction doesn't occur while refusing to even inquire about it. In this world, too, the body is just a matter of which I, a thing of which I am in charge, and charged to self-maximize. There's no deeper meaning to the body. Of course, that's really weird because obviously there's some deeper meaning to the body, to sex, because we have a Me Too movement. We've got P. Diddy on the cover of the newspaper every day. Obviously, sexual touching and sexual matters have some more electricity, some more meaning than they're willing to give it. And finally, of course, in this universe, there's no help for figuring out to live. You have the abortion and it's like, girl power, okay, bye now, right? One, David Letterman used to have a comment about failed comedians trying to gin up a sense of fun and he would say, one has the impression fun is happening here, <laughs> even when it's not. Well, sometimes you think of these, these movements for abortion, it's like, one has the impression there's a women's movement here. Oh, but it's not. There's nothing here. There's nothing positive for you. There's no next step. It's just have the abortion. Even Catherine McKinnon, who's you know, not left her, her pro-legal abortion position, will say this is leaving women alone with their privacy to suffer. There's nothing. So in this inhumane and hopeless world, especially for women, painted by abortion advocates, what are pro-lifers doing? Well, you can scan through all the pro-life um, uh, sites and information out there, and they're doing two beautiful things. It's just insufficient. 
Number one, they're talking about the beauty of that child, the pictures of the child's innocence, trying to evoke us to care about the child. Uh, when I wrote my first family law book called Putting Children's Interests First in U.S. Family Law, my, uh, my husband, he says, Helen, <laughs> children don't vote and they don't contribute to campaigns. Why are you putting children forward as an issue people could care about? And, and, and Robert Putnam, when he wrote a book, Our Kids, and he says, well, I thought people would care about kids. And then there's like a dot, dot, dot in the interview. I hope so. Sorry, not so sure they do, okay? And number two is they're talking about all the help they provide, which is legion, right? It's thousands of centers offering help to women. When I was interviewed by NPR, uh, right after Dobbs came down. It was one of the only interviews I took. My husband had passed away just a, about a month before. I was just a mess and um, still am. Just want to clarify that. We, 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 we do things even if we're a mess, right, Richard? <laughs> um, we, uh, I took the interview because I thought NPR is awful and I can take it. I can handle them. And they said, well, you, you know, will the pro-lifers finally do things for, you know? And I was like, why would you even ask me that question when abortion advocates do nothing? I was just, I'd had it. It's like, we do, we have millions of services for millions of women and you don't offer anything. Why are you even asking me that question? Silence. <laughs> I, got a, I got a couple of moments of silence on NPR. You can thank me for just a couple of moments when NPR stopped talking, okay? so. But this is not enough because it doesn't offer a world, a complete world in which having a baby makes sense. Having help, even for a long time, for women, they just, they need something else, okay? So I think you have to paint an entire worldview to paint a worldview where being entering into a lifelong relationship of mutual love and, and, and eventual interdependence, although in the beginning just caretaking, makes sense. A world in which it makes sense to think that tomorrow might have hope. Maybe even ongoing relationship with a man, the child of the father, it would make sense to know you could have that before you had a baby together. A world in which there is a firm basis that you are loved and have the opportunity to give love. This leads me to the thought that I said I hadn't entertained seriously before, which is that the U.S. church should take up the pro-life conversation from an explicitly religious point of view. Now, of course, I don't mean to leave reason behind. The church could not do that. It's not in our nature, right? But the, the compelling information about the reasons, the scientific, empirical, et cetera, for not uh, having an abortion, it's out there all the time, right? Look at Students for Life, look at the Susan B. Anthony list, look at 40 Days for Life, look at live action, look at the March for Life, I could go on, right? They're doing a beautiful job. <clears throat> now, interestingly, of course, these are led by people of faith, most often women of faith. Um, but the church has to recall people to their humanity and to the realistic possibility of hope, okay? That it is possible in a, in a world that has been painted by the other side as zero sum, self-maximizing monad, girl power, meaning being unfettered, et cetera. It is possible to love faithfully, to love sacrificially, to hope for a lifelong relationship with the father of one's child, to take joy in one's children, to be able to maintain a proper relationship with material things, with work, so that you have the opportunity to love your family and feel you're doing justice to them, okay? That kind of worldview. Only the good news of Jesus Christ is up to this, in my view. The, the church right now, and um, uh, I'm going to be really critical here, you know, I think when Richard and I were in the pro-life office and for some years um, um, after our leaving, um, they had more of a national footprint. They seem to have completely abdicated, and I don't get it. It's in particular dioceses, in particular parishes, you see some good work, but the specific beauty of faith and reason together from religious figures. I don't care what anybody says about you know, making fun of clergy, bishops, et cetera, that, that do this. When I would do radio programs with individual bishops, like do them together, women would call in and they'd want to talk to me, but it's like they wanted to talk to the church as represented by, by, by people with an expertise in faith who had spent decades in it. They didn't just want to talk to me. Great laywoman, mother, you know, I've, I've had miscarriages, you know, great, want to talk to you. I need to talk to, I need to talk to somebody you know, who I can talk about confession to, I can talk about post-abortion healing, I can talk about my qualms of conscience, et cetera. Um, they're not there right now, and I wish they would be. And if they were, 
here's what I tell them to do, <laughs> okay? Um, the first thing is we have to confront people with reality, which is what abortion actually is. And John Paul II in Evangelium Vitae, for instance, is just a perfect exemplar of this. He says, especially in the case of abortion, there's a use of ambiguous terminology, such as interruption of pregnancy, which hides its true nature and attenuates its seriousness. Um, then he says, but the moral gravity of procured abortion is apparent in all its truth. If we recognize we're dealing with murder, and in particular, the specific elements involved were eliminating a human being at the beginning of life. No one more innocent can be imagined. He or she is weak, defenseless, even lacking that minimal form of defense consisting in the poignant power of a newborn baby's cry and tears. The child is totally entrusted to the protection and care of the woman carrying him or her. And yet it is precisely the mother herself who has offered the decision for that child to be eliminated. Bam, say it like it is. And I can tell you so many of the other greats in the movement. Mother Teresa simply called it violence, saying it is so sad to tell people to kill to get what they want. He just puts it so plainly. Walker Percy in his New York Times article that was uh, something about abortion to offend everybody when it looked like the Human Life Amendment was not going to be passed. He writes to the side on the favor of abortion and he says, hey, it looks like you're going to get your way, but you're not going to have it both ways. We're going to tell you what you're doing. And then he compares the pro-life voice to the voice of Galileo at the end of the trial saying, and yet it moves. <laughs> and he says, that's our voice now. I don't think this is the equivalent of waving bloody pictures in front of unwilling members of the public, right? I think this is just saying this is what it is. I wrote this in an article in Newsweek, um, just here's what it is. And I, I wasn't bloody about it, I wasn't violent about it. I was like, hey America, you're saying that the people most in charge of caring for somebody have the right to kill it, but only when it's most defenseless. Is this really who we are right now? And it got horrible. I mean, the pushback was so ugly. So what finally are the series of Catholic understandings about the world that I would say could give hope, that would make a choice for life more possible? And I'll go quickly through these. We can plumb them further if you'd like during Q&A. First of all, that the universe is made by a loving God. Yes, there's sin. Yes, there's failings. But the, the default position is God's love permeates the universe. His love is quite personal. He weeps over Lazarus. He sees the widow who's lost her only son, and he has to do something for her. He weeps over the fate of Jerusalem. His love is radical. He's not just a little bit nicer than you and me. He's on a whole different plane, right? His love is radical, and he asks us to be capable to enact radical loves, to be too good to be true right, in an instance, and to make his presence felt. Cardinal O'Connor saying to the world, any woman who wants to come to New York from anywhere and get any kind of help struggling with the thought of abortion, come here. That's radical, okay? That we're stewards, cooperators with this new life. This life which God already has a relationship with. I met a young woman at a crisis pregnancy center who was giving a testimony a few months ago. And she's, a, uh, she's Chinese. She was an atheist. Uh, this was in San Francisco. And she said, it struck me at some point, and it was this Catholic crisis pregnancy center, because of everything that was around me, that the God these people were talking about already had a relationship with my child, and it wasn't mine to end. It was the imagery around her that she said, oh, God already knows this child. It's, of course, also that the body is sacred, OK? That it's designed by God, not by us. That relationships are as primary to us as being alone. And that not only are we meant to be gifted givers, but we have to give other people the opportunity to give, because that's who they are, too. I learned this after my husband passed, the number of people who helped me. I, I felt like I'm going to be in debt to you for the rest of my life for all that you've done for me. And the response was, oh my God, no, I need to do this. This is, this is just, my love comes out. I have to follow this. They need to understand that other people, uh, they are gifted givers too. The other thing is that God sends other people to you to be Christ, okay? And that you should see him in them. And finally, that there are glimpses of the kingdom, but not yet. Okay, sometimes my daughter and son-in-law are here at Notre Dame, and I think of all their fabulous friends and the people who have shown them love in preparing them for the marriage and preparing them to welcome new life and everything. And I think when I come here, I see these communities that are glimpses of the kingdom. 
right? Glimpses of beauty. You read, the Sisters of Life send you their magazine and you see young women that they've helped who say, it was, I was dead and then I felt resurrected. These aren't even religious young girls. I was, I was brought back to life. And finally to say, these things are not unable to be received, even if we speak with a religious voice. When the New York Times responded to John Paul II's Evangelium Vitae, they said, huh, culture of death, he has a point. <laughs> when the Wall Street Journal wrote their famous No Guardrails article after um, uh, a shooting at an abortion clinic and the bombing at the Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City, they said, you know, there really is something like a culture of death and it's being brought to us by the elites and maybe we need to respond with something radically new. So even if we speak just religiously, God's word is living and effective, and it's more powerful than what we can come up with ourselves. And I think now is the time for it. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Uh, I'll stand here so I can see everybody. We have about 17 minutes for Q&A. Thank you. Um, I was a campaign worker on the uh, Kansas abortion referendum, which was the first one after Dobbs, and we lost pretty badly. Um, and on that campaign, the campaign management uh, made it a point to do the secular um, argumentation that you're talking about. Uh, the campaign was explicitly non-religious. They thought that would hurt the campaign. Um, we lost very bad, so I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying about um, coming at things from a much more um, explicitly religious uh, point of rhetoric. But from a legal perspective, that might be more difficult. And so I guess my question is, um, what are the ways that um, what you're saying about the way we might need to change our rhetoric applies in the legal arguments that we're making? Because when we're talking, uh, ideally, Dobbs isn't the end. Ideally, we're, we're working on this not from just a cultural perspective, for, but from a legal perspective. So I guess how, how does what you're saying apply to the legal arguments yeah. that we should make? It, it, it's, yeah, is this on? Okay, it, it's not part of the legal argument. Um, yeah, you know, I, I uh, assisted in the amicus briefs the U.S. bishops wrote to the Supreme Court. I've written them on my own since. Uh, the legal argument is something very different. Um, uh, the, what the Supreme Court did in the Dobbs majority opinion, its substantive due process argument, um, what we're going to need to do with the level of state constitutions on who is a person or what is contained in the state's own sort of version of substantive due process. Um, but when you're talking about like a Kansas referendum, you're talking about getting people to the polls to vote. <laughs> Those people who are going to be turned off, first of all, the message that I've articulated, I mean, they'll make it ugly. They'll, they'll lie about anything and they'll turn anything against us. It's not as if we're going to be turning off the people who would otherwise have been sympathetic to us. <laughs> Uh, in my view, and especially not if we do it the way I described it, which is not you bloody murderers. I do think, when, and when I wrote that Newsweek piece, which you can see, um, I said something like, as a country, and I wanted to, this was my secular version of John Paul II's Evangelium Vitae, so you could see it for its verbiage. I said, you know, as a country, we are asking the person who is charged with care of, of this new life to be the person who makes the decision to take that life. And what does this say about, are we afraid of our future? Do we not have enough resources for the next generation? Do we not really tell women and their children and the fathers of these children, we're there for you? I put it that way. I didn't talk about the religious. But in a, in a situation of a referendum or a situation of a political campaign between candidates with different positions on it, that, the secular argument, I mean, the, the, the pro-life groups that are out there, they're sophisticated, they're led by these fabulous women I adore. Um, uh, they're doing a good job. The church has the faith and reason stuff that you're just not seeing out there. That's where I think it's effective. I mean, if you look at my amicus briefs, like in the Little Sisters of the Poor case, or even in the Obergefell case, Obergefell, it was like, here's the Supreme Court's family law jurisprudence, children have to be put first in the marriage issue. Here's, um, here's the scientific argument about contraception, and it's against your claim that it's a compelling state interest that can overcome religious freedom. Um, strictly, that's it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you think that the reason that Catholic uh, schools and parishes have been so silent for so long 
about abortion or just not clear, timid, is because of its link to tax exemption. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that in schools. They mm -hmm. won't, they're just silent. I'm gonna start, but then ask Richard what he thinks about this, since I'd like to, um, I'd like to know what he's been ruminating off on the West Coast while I'm on the East Coast thinking about this. Um, a couple of things. Number one, I think a lot of uh, Catholic uh, employees are very poorly formed. And so they know the church's rule. You just the way the world looks at us, it, you know, as you have a rule, the bishop made me do it, you know, this sort of thing. I think a lot of our own employees have the same uh, limited view. Um, Oh, that's the rule here. They don't actually understand the, uh, the beauty of our position under it or that it is, it is inseparable from our social justice position, right? That good Samaritan treatment of people begins with not killing them, you know, continues with taking care of them in the womb and, and as infants and so forth, uh, that, it, that it belongs in our family as well as out there. Um, I think the, so I think poor formation is a huge part of it. I think the fear I mean, it is, it is vicious backlash. You know, I don't just get, um, I, I don't just get people saying to me, I disagree with you. I get them saying, I am blackballing you from publication. I am, uh, I, I got up to speak at Louisiana State University and they were like, oh, the dean canceled you five minutes ago. I'm sorry, we can't sponsor you here at the law school. Why? Well, you said something in one of your books. And I said, which one of you students had me canceled, and this girl says, oh, I spoke to the dean. I said, what, tell me what you said, and she quoted something, and I said, where did you get that? And then she named the book, and I said, that's not my book. I mean, it's sort of like, like it just, the backlash is, is stupid, it's mean, and it accuses you of being a hater, of being a danger to people. So I think there's a lot of fear of that. I think there's a sense um, in some schools that, oh, we don't want to have, we don't want to push parents away. Only half of them come to church anyway. They have a tenuous relationship with this school. They're only here because this expensive private Catholic high school gets you into good colleges. So it's, I think it's the various constituencies associated with it. And I think most people are not beautifully enabled to talk about our teachings on respect for life or sex or marriage or parenthood. That's why I wrote my last book, just, it's called Religious Freedom After the Sexual Revolution, to give people words on, and, on holistically about that. I don't know, Richard, what, what do you think? It's, it's uh, well, I think among the things that many Catholics don't understand is how limited that tax exemption uh, standard is and how actually the the Catholic bishop's policy is broader than what tax exemption requires in terms of staying out of electioneering for or against candidates. We, we even have a policy of not taking a position for or against nominees for things like cabinet posts and uh, court appointments, which we could have done with the tax exempt status. But there are a lot of Catholics and this was, uh, we did a survey of parishioners years ago. There was a great blow to the pro-life office and the social justice office that one of the most fervent requests from rank and file parishioners was no politics in church. And they meant something far broader than that. They meant don't talk about these divisive social issues that have a moral component. But we have to. What are we there for? Uh, to talk about morality, not just personal morality, but social morality. And, uh, and so you draw that line. And I mean, in the terms of the law, you're, you're perfectly safe. The church can even take positions on and put money into uh, debates about uh, ballot initiatives, because that's an issue, that's not a candidate. So I, I, I think people do think that, but uh, they don't understand. Yeah, they're uh, legally wrong. Yeah, it's, it's not a legal problem. And, and you can get into uh, public policy issues as long as it's a, a not a substantial portion of your total budget as a church. And as somebody who for many years got his salary from them, I can testify that it is not a substantial <laughs> But 
one thing the Catholic Church did, and I was amazed at the, the foresight of this, one thing the church did do long before Dobbs was they initiated this walking with women in, walking with moms in need program, urging every diocese, every parish to see what more it can do to help increase support for pregnancy aid, to help women and families. And, uh, and that's, that's paid off to a certain extent. And it's very uncelebrated. Uh, in my uh, home state of Washington state now, we have a program called PREPARES, short for Pregnancy and Parenting Services, that not only helps women with their material needs when they're pregnant, uh, but each <clears throat> woman or family gets a volunteer companion whose job it is to make sure they have everything they need for five years until the child is in first grade in school. So, you know, oh, you guys don't care after birth. Well, yeah, you do. Uh, and we know that uh, Catholic Charities people from around the country have come to learn from our local program because they want to start it in their area. All of those things are a wonderful aid to the culture of life. But, the, uh, but at the same time, we need to talk about why are we doing all that? We're doing this for the woman. We're doing it for the baby as well. Why? Well, the baby matters too. Let us tell you about that. <laughs> the gentleman in the very back corner. I think your thoughts with regards to changing worldview are essential. My concern is not just from the institution with the Catholic Church, which we've talked about in the last question, but within the rank and file individuals in the church, if we look at surveys, a lot of that seems to, with regards to life issues, seems to parallel the greater society. So how do we move forward with this presenting a more compelling worldview if our own house or the individuals in the house don't seem to be on board with it? I would start by saying it's not as bleak as we might think. If you look at people who take the Catholic label, you'll see something that reflects the culture. If you look at people who practice, they're dramatically more pro-life. There really is um, quite a good, more than critical mass among the people who practice. Um, speaking to the gentleman who worked in the Kansas one, getting them out to do something about it is then the next step. But, um, but I do think that, um, you know, it's, it's hard to get even the church. Here's where I, I I'm, uh, will say that I am in sympathy more with the idea that it's pretty rough out there. The idea that these issues regarding respect for life, sex, marriage, parenting, um, are um, something we could take up without, being, um, <clears throat> without our, our social lives or our professional lives ending. You know, it, it's, uh, it's frightening for a lot of people. Um, and... Um, I think we have to give people the courage to do that, which is hard, but does have to be done in, our, in the institutions where Catholics are showing up. It has to be done in a parish. It has to be done in a Catholic school. Um, Catholics, too, I think, have the idea, and I've often used this image, that you know, these issues are like a sign hanging off the building. The building is the church and all the lovely things she does for the poor and how she, you come to church and in their view, she doesn't judge you. She just welcomes you. And then these sex, marriage, and parenting issues are this sign swinging off the building with a big target on it. Like, oh, hit me, right? We're, we're extra. But this, in fact, and again, one of the things I tried to do in the book, it's been a passion ever since Richard and I worked together, and we tried to say, no, the social justice office over there and ourselves are not different. That, that care for, the, for, for our family is the beginning of social justice. Chastity is the beginning of social justice, right? It just is. And um, so all these efforts to get this in the schools, I was talking to Anna Moreland yesterday who has a new book out called um, a Young Adult Playbook where she sort of is talking to like college seniors about this. My book, which is for anybody who communicates in a Catholic institution, to give them courage and say, we know it's not the only issue, but like frankly, it's the issue on which we're getting shot at. Let's be really good at this. Um, the, and, and open, frankly, communication skills. I used to say, when I first started working in pro-life, I was like, hey, I'm a lawyer. What am I doing in the office of blah, 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 right? The communications office. You really, communications, writing skill is an incredible service to the church. Learning not just the what, but how to say it. 
Um, from my daughter's uh, writing course at U Chicago, Little Red Schoolhouse, which I looked at online, um, the, the starting point is don't tell people what you know, blah, blah, blah. Tell them what you need them to think. And I first need to think, hey, I know you don't want to have this debate in an uninformed fashion. I know you want to say that you've looked at both sides. I mean, they don't want any such darn thing. I mean, we know that. But, but open up by disarming. I know that you want to hear a reasoned, civil, information-laden argument, and I'm here to give it to you. But, but I have to say, I agree with you in the sense that we're not prepared for this. And we're not asking the church to become one issue or obsessed. We're asking them to overcome this giant hurdle to people's appreciation of our teachings on this, and frankly, of our church overall. Fran. Yeah, Uh, in, in regard to uh, the tax exemption, you know, uh, Archbishop Schapp, you never endorsed a candidate. I mean, he did talk about guidelines for voting and that sort of thing. It was either in 2012 or 2016, he got pulled in by the IRS for doing exactly that. So there's a lot of pressure from the government in indirect ways to, deep, to damp down any kind of uh, resistance to these certain policies. The other thing that I'm obsessed with is uh, how, do you, how do you get... How do you get the bishops to encourage people uh, to pay the cost, to be explicit about the cost it's going to take, to be, uh, to be prophetic about a lot of Catholic views? I just, uh, you know, I, I, mean, I worked for a guy who had that kind of backbone. I don't know how to clone that, you know? And, and uh, if you have any thoughts about how we can get Catholics to think in those terms of resistance and long-term change rather than we'll fix it at the ballot box. I'd, I'm, I'd really like to hear it because I'm kind of out of gas on that. Okay. And when you say the cost, you mean sort of the human cost? Like, okay. Yeah, I mean, okay, I may lose my job. <laughs> I may not know okay. how to get people willing to do that because that's where it's heading. Yeah, but, you know, you can make friends with pro-life people who are really nice. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, I think that is part of it. Well, and that's, that's why part of your message does have to be at least implicitly a, a religious message because it means take up your cross, follow me. Uh, but the things that matter the most are the things that are worth hurting for. Uh, and I think... You know, it's, it's amazing that you've had, for example, a law professor at Harvard, Marianne Glendon, who was untouchable because she was so good at what she does, even though she's uh, a fantastic uh, pro-life advocate. Uh, you have people who are still in politics, though some have fallen, uh, who are very much pro-life. Uh, and... I don't know, I think, uh, I always figured that, you know, as when I was working for the pro-life office, uh, you always have these, these little moments of grace when it, it turned out that, like, our oldest daughter was, was very proud of me that I got onto, uh, I got into New York Times Magazine for my efforts against uh, embryonic stem cell research. And then, for years, one of her closest friends wouldn't talk to her because her father had Parkinson's and she thought I was trying to kill her father by denying him embryonic stem cells. Uh, embryonic stem cells don't do a damn thing for him, with Parkinson's disease. But anyway, uh, you, know, you, find, you find people who are supportive, but at the same time, you're always going to be surrounded by people who uh, need to know why you're doing this, and might even be interested occasionally after a beer or two to learn why. Can I add one thing? Mm -hmm. We're out of time, but the other thing is they, they have to have a community of people who are supporting them. I'm helping some students now who are in a very fraught situation uh, in connection with issues like this, and they have to have a professor who's willing to go to bat for them. Um, you have to have a community. Um, in the case of particular clerics or um, leaders in the church um, who are ordained, um, it's nice to have some lay people who have your back and who are helping giving you the word. I have a bishop who's ready to write this editorial with me. And I'm kind of shocked he's willing to say the kind of things I want to say. And he's like, well, as long as we're together in it. You know, I know you know your stuff. 
So I think having a community of people who have your back. Um, I've seen people who lost their jobs over pro-life, and I've seen the Catholic institutions didn't just scoop up and hire them right away. Hey, what's the problem with you? So that the community actually has to um, be responsible for them. We have to, and we have to, we have to make them feel conscientiously obligated to do so. Well, I'm sorry to the many people whose questions we didn't get to, but I want to respect your time and theirs and your ability to get to the next thing. So please join me in thanking them. <laughs>